Ever wanted to draft for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet the Indigo Disc, but don't know where to start? Well, this is a series for you. What's going on, everybody? You have Tone here, back with another episode of How to Draft in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet the Indigo Disc. Again, I do want to apologize for the little delay between this episode and the last one. Um, I did make a post earlier saying that I did end up getting sick uh, the past week, and I really did not want to record a video where I'm constantly coughing and all that stuff. It just wouldn't have been a right to do something like that. But at the very least, I am 100% now, thankfully for that. And we are back to making these types of draft league videos. If you guys missed episode 3, there will be a link in the top right of the video so you can check out our last video on uh, Great Tusk, Zapdos, and Hisuian Samurai. Now, this time though, I do, before I get started and in going into the core, I decided to go for, for episode 4, I, I do want to touch on a topic that I didn't really grasp or go more into detail about as part as part of these videos so um, I believe Ryoma gaming was the one who brought to my attention and that is basically going into more in depth on balance and defensive cores so basically there are balance and defensive cores in draft league format technically speaking there are also offensive cores but what exactly makes a core what it is? So that's what I'll be going into a bit more detail about in the first half of this video. Then we'll get into the core and the draft. Um, go from there. So basically, a core in and of itself is basically just two or three Pokemon. Mainly three that has synergy mainly through their typing or also through whatever checks and counters they may in interact with on a regular basis. Of course, that sort of concept is different from a draft perspective because you're not fighting every single Pokemon um, available in draft league format. You're only fighting a select few, so you don't really have to worry about certain Pokemon depending on who you're facing. But regardless, in terms of cores in and of itself, taking type advantage into <clears throat> into consideration whether it be fire water grass or dragon steel fairy or um for the most part the, the the third one is a little bit confusing for some people but basically it's a fighting dark and the last type it can either be psychic or ghost this is just more of a type synergistic thing Fire, Water, Grass, and Dragon Steel Fairy are obviously two of the more common type cores that come into mind when people think about Draft League format. The third one, though, is a bit more. <clears throat> it's a bit more not counterintuitive, but they both sort of feel the same thing. And by that, I mean Psychic and Ghost, their stabs are problematically. are They both have problems dealing with Dark type Pokemon. Which is where the fighting type, a good fighting type Pokemon, would help deal with that problem, and then of course both, uh, both the psychic and the fighting type Pokemon will struggle with ghosts. On top of that, and the same thing with ghosts and fighting will struggle with ghosts from a defensive standpoint, which is nice to have a strong dark type option as well. This core is a little bit underknown, not really underknown, but a little undervalued. When it comes to a core, a commonality core, and it's not really something that people would consider being a type core, but it is something to consider. So psychic fighting dark, or ghost fighting dark, one of those two type cores would work. And to go a bit more into example, with a sort of balanced core for these typings, we have this. So I just threw these together basically as an example for what a balanced core would look like now you could take it with a grain of salt there's obviously other concepts of cores that can be easily put together utilizing these type cores but the main thing to take it to take away from this example is not only the type synergy but the roles the main thing you want to have when it comes to whether it being a balanced or a defensive core 
is having roles in play. The last thing you want to do when it comes to having type synergy is having one Pokemon check certain amount, check X amount of Pokemon and then have another Pokemon with a different typing that works with your core, but also check the same amount of Pokemon. So to make an example with this, the Firewater Grass core I have here, Folkorona, Azumarill, Meowskarada. Mainly it's seen as being an offensive core just from the fact that Volcarona is mostly seen as being a Quiver Dance user, Azumarill can be Choice Ban or Belly Drum, and Meowskarada is a hard hitting physical attacker. But the main thing to take apart from this particular core in general is certain roles. And by that I mean, necessarily speaking, Volcarona doesn't have to be your win con. It doesn't have to be your your primary win con in this scenario. Volcarona can break for a zoom roll for a belly drum late game sweep. Both Meowskarada, I mean Meowskarada can cover bulky water types, which for the most part Volcarona can cover with Giga Drain, but not foolproof. Azumarill can straight struggle to break past bulky waters. Other Pokemon with like Water Absorb or Storm Drain, so like Water Absorb Clodsire, Gastrodon, stuff like that. Meowskarada can cover for that. And on top of that, it does get access to stuff that can also address dealing with Heat Train for Volcarona, stuff like Low Kick or Aura Sphere, something like that. So the main thing to take about for making this this the Firewater Grass Core more balanced as opposed to looked at more offensively as well. Both Azumarill and Volcarona have the means to be run defensively, which is what separates a balanced core from a more offensive core. With an offensive core, you're not really looking at defensive synergy in terms of or or being able to tank hits, I should say, in terms of making a core function. You're more so worried about making a certain mod Pokemon or setup sweeper be better at its job by using another offensive Pokemon to deal with the threats that your sweeper cannot struggle to break past. So for example, if I were to take Azumarill out of this equation and just leave Volcarona and Meowstarada, or conversely Volcarona and Azumarill, technically speaking, the core can still work. You will utilize Quiver Dance Volcarona and use Azumarill as a means to break past rock types, like rock types, like um, stuff like Heatran and bulky waters. You just power through with like Choice Bandit Player Ups and all that stuff. But you still would have that problem with other bulky waters, especially if they're able to survive stuff like Giga Drain from Volcarona. Meowstarada, while not being known as a defensive option can still function as well as being able to deal with bulky water types as well as being able to always so surprise supply support with spikes so that's basically the reason why i did this specific three type this three one combo here because two pokemon have the means to be bulky enough to work as a balance core and meowskarada can still function as a offensive pivot for the most part. So that's where the concept between balance and offense goes. If this was a more offensive build, then Azumarill could easily be something <clears throat> something along the lines like maybe um, Keldeo is an example, something like Quaquavolt. Quaquavolt can also be a bulky water as well, but something a lot more offensive in nature, something that's less likely to be a bulky water, but it can still tank a hit, but has the ability to be a lot more offensive in nature, more hard hitting, that doesn't have to rely on priority, like a zoom roll to get past faster threats. So something along those lines could definitely work. It still would be a balanced core, but it would lean more towards an offensive-ish core. Just because of the fact that whatever you replace a zoom roll with, whether it be Keldeo, Quaquaval, they can still function and make a balanced core. It would just be a little bit more difficult depending on the matchups that come up in the for this particular three Pokemon core. It can still work, but from a more offensive approach. So if you have like 
not even Keldeo or Quaquaval, like any real offensive water type that's not really known for its defense. So let's say going down the line, uh, Inteleon, let's say, in, let's go for Inteleon. A Pokemon that's known for its speed and hit, it's hard hitting a special attacker, but you're not really thinking of, let me switch this into attacks. You're not really thinking of Inteleon as being a Pokemon that does that. It can still do that, but not to to a lesser extent as opposed to an Azumarill or a Keldeo or a Quaquaval. So that's basically what comes down to what makes a balanced core balance. The ability to have something, two, at least two over three Pokemon in your core, being able to function both offensively as well as being able to tank hit defensively and still function as your primary means of getting your goal or your main thing accomplished in what you want to build when it comes to drafting, let alone team building. <clears throat> so, same thing also applies to the Dragon Steel Fairy Core, Latias, Heatran, Clefable. This is probably as balanced as balance gets for Dragon Steel Fairy. You have Clefable, only weak to poison and steel, Heatran resists both, Heatran, weak to water, weak four times weak to ground, weak to fighting. You have Clefable, resists fighting, Clef Latias, resists fighting, resists water, immune to ground because of levitate. So this is a very nice offensive-ish balanced core. And the thing that makes this great as a balanced core is all three of these Pokemon have the means of being used offensively. Latias doesn't have to be like some tank or like stuck in a bulky calm mind setting. It can run choice specs, it can do choice scarf, Heatran, can be choice specs, it can be choice scarf, it can be offensive. Clefable, it doesn't have to be defensive all the time. You can run offensive life orb and still get the, the same job accomplished and still have the means of being able to tank hits. All three of those Pokemon function very, very well in that regard. And on top of that, you have your support with Stealth Rock with either Clefable or Heatran, and then Latias, as well as Clefable, providing healing wish support, and wish support from Clef. So you have a lot going on in three Pokemon already that makes a balanced core truly balanced. You not only have your type synergy, you also have roll compression, and you get a lot more out of these Pokemon, and you can mix and match however you choose, because one Pokemon can be offensive, the other two can be more defensive, but you don't really have to be locked into which two Pokemon have to be the defensive role, which one has to be the offensive role. It's very interchangeable, and it's a really nice cohesion between these three Pokemon in general. And then you have the Fighting Dark and then Ghost or Psychic Core here. <clears throat> so the one thing I do like, at the very least, when it comes to Psychic Fighting Dark, one of my favorite things about having a great psychic type Pokemon is pairing it with a great fighting type. And mainly when it comes to a psychic type, for this example I'm using Slowking because I feel like it's a bit more underappreciated. But the nice thing about Slowking is psychic type with access to Future Sight in conjunction with a strong fighting type Pokemon like Great Tusk is fantastic. You have the ability to bait in poison types, and if your opponent forgets about Future Sight being up, they could potentially lose their Tusk check, their Fighting check, all in one fell swoop. The other nice thing about Fighting and Psychic, or even Fighting and Ghost, like I mentioned earlier, they both struggle to deal with Ghost types, since obviously Psychic type Pokemon are really most Psychic type Pokemon aren't really known for their bulk. Per se, so that's where having a strong dark type like a Roaring Moon would benefit from dealing with those ghost types. On top of that, it also comes down to having coverage. While this core itself, Slowking, Tusk, Moon, they can struggle with fairy type Pokemon. Slowking can can switch into fairy type attacks, but in terms of doing damage back, it's a bit of a problem. But the nice thing about it is Slowking does have access to Chili Reception to bring in 
stuff like Roaring Moon a lot safer without having to worry about taking any entry hazard damage, which is why I like Slow King particularly on this sort of core thing, because Future Sight plus Chilly Reception, having the strong fighting type to bait in other defensive checks is really, really beneficial. And the same thing also applies here to Tusk, Moon, and Gengar. The reason why I went Gengar on this particular core as opposed to like Dragapult for the most part, Tusk and Moon are both weak to Fairy. You at the very least want to have some way of pressuring Fairy type Pokemon. I mean, you do have Iron Head on Roaring Moon, but sometimes that's not going to be enough. And this is what makes a balanced core a bit more offensive. If you do Sloking Tusk Moon, it's a bit more balanced ish because Tusk has the means of being run offensively. And it can still function as a defensive pivot since it has very good physical defense to tank those physical hits. Sloking is like underappreciated as far as I'm concerned. It can take most special attacks with ease. Hazard Generator, Chili Reception to bring in Great Tusk, bring in Roaring Moon. And for the most part, having Roaring Moon act as a sort of setup sweeper to benefit from the slow pivoting from Slow King is also very beneficial. If you don't want to go the Slow King route, then you get something like Gengar. Gengar also helps address the fairy issue. Um, while you may not be one that switches into attacks, but Gengar does apply the pressure to fairy types to the point where you're not relying solely on Roaring Moon or trying to weaken the fairy type Pokemon with Great Tusk. This would make it more of an offensive core, and by that, I mean the defensive synergy is a little bit less, and by that I mean like Tusk can still be like physically defensive, Roaring Moon can easily do like specially defensive as well because it has, it has relatively good special bulk, and being more defensive allows it to be like a bulky DD um, set if you want to go that route. But for the most part, it does have the, the tools to do it because it has the stats to do it. So it can be a bit more defensive in nature, and you still get that U-turn momentum into Gengar to lure in those fairies. So that's what I mean why that could be a bit more balanced in nature. Roaring Moon does not have to be seen solely as a offensive Dragon Dance sweeper. It can do specially defensive. It's not out of the realm of possibility that it cannot do that role. So that's pretty much what I went with here in terms of what makes a balanced core truly balanced. Defensive cores, <clears throat> for the most part, also has a similar thing, but it's less so on having Pokemon that can function offensively and defensively, and it relies more so on just their ability to tank hits. They're not really known for their offensive prowess. So, a common example for that would be having, like... <sighs> Like a slight example would be something like a um like a Dundozo or a Gastrodon and then you would pair it up with something like maybe like a Skeleturge. Like just to have one example thrown out the way. But this is basically like an unaware core. So basically you're relying a little bit less so on your offense and relying more on your defensive ability to check certain Pokemon in conjunction with your ability to make things difficult for your opponent to break through your team. Um, of course, Skeletor is a little bit um, less of a wall because it does have a means of being offensive because of Torch Song. But basically, the concept applies to like other Pokemon as well. If you want to go all the way back to like the old days of like Scarm Bliss, like Skarmory plus Blissey, that's a general example that's not really seen in Draft League format because they're way too passive on its own and it can easily be taken advantage of, especially in a more offensive meta like how Gen 9 has already turned out to be. So that's one example of like being truly defensive or anything like a Quagsire or Quagsire plus like low tier stuff like Vileplume, like stuff that can potentially still hit relatively hard. But not hard enough to the point where you're like worried about it. So stuff like Cresselia, you're not really thinking Cresselia as a offensive threat. It's gonna tank a bunch of hits. It's gonna be difficult to break past it. But you don't have to worry about being threatened by it offensively, unless it's called mine and you let them get out of hand. 
but normally if you draft well enough, you can avoid that altogether. So that being said, so that's pretty much what I wanted to get it, um, talk about when it came to balance and defensive cores. So basically, uh, condensed version, balanced cores are pretty much a core of Pokemon that can have the ability to function offensively and defensively while not really losing anything in both. It basically is like a Swiss army knife, if you want to put it that way, of Pokemon. Pokemon that can function offensively and defensively can be EV'd to tank certain hits and still have the offensive capabilities to make a threat on your opponent's build. Or whatever combination of mods they might bring, you have the means to tank those hits, you have the means to retaliate, and you have the means to put yourself in the best position to win. So, if you want to use any of these cores as an example for your next draft, by all means, go right ahead. Anything else that I may have left out, you can let me know in the comments. But for this for this episode though, and I meant to do this a week sooner had I not gotten sick, but this time though, I wanted to be a bit more proactive with this core, with my upcoming core. So, with that being said, we're going to be focusing a bit more on what I did not talk about much of, and that is offense. Um, normally draft league format is more about making the most making the most balanced approach to drafting while having a combination of offensive defensive threats and trying to make the best team available at your disposal this time though i've decided that i wanted to go a bit next to the next step and what i mean by the next step is addressing hyper offense or offense in general so not only am I doing a balanced team with this core, I will also be doing an offensive build with the same core. And the core we have for this episode of How to Draft is the unequivocal Dragon Steel Fairy core that is Latios, Enamorous, and Scizor. Why did I pick these three Pokemon? Uh, first and foremost, there was no actual reasoning behind this. My, it wasn't really to put together a Dragon Steel Fairy Core per se, but the concept between these three Pokemon are very, very nice, especially considering the buffs that Latios and even Latias got with the DLC. Enamorous is a formidable offensive fairy type Pokemon that can pretty much get out of hand with Moonblast. Um, using contrary to its advantage if it ever gets a special attack drop or will increase in this matter. And Scizor just seemed like the best deal to put with a core like this. Because Latios plus Enamorous is already an offensive core. And I felt the best thing to, uh, to pair up with these Pokemon while making it look relatively plausible to actually get these Pokemon. Is having a Pokemon like Scizor that can reliably lake in cleanup with priority bullet punch. So, with that being said, let's jump right into the team. But first, the common rules and roles I'll be using from before. Nothing has really changed from the last time I made this to the last time I made this rules and roles thing. Um and I know some people talk about someone talked about why do I not include Terra as a factor? Basically, when it comes to me putting these teams together, the last thing I want to do is make up for any flaws or lack of a typing when it comes to drafting in the build and relying on terrestrialization to make up for it. I don't want to go into a situation where, oh, I don't have a water type on this draft. Let me make one of my Pokemon Terra Water to make up for that. That just seems like it's just being lackadaisical and for the most part being lazy. I don't want to be lazy when it comes to making these videos. I don't want to be lazy when it comes to putting together these teams. I want to put the best teams possible and plausible together for you guys to get a grasp yourself on how to reliably draft and put together teams without having to rely on game mechanics to make up for any lackluster building that may have come up when you came to put your team together. That's pretty much what I was going for here when it came to Terra not playing a factor. If anything, I want Terra to be an extension 
of the abilities that you can use at your disposal. And by that, I mean when it comes to making your own terror captains and making your own teams, I want there to be an extension of what potential you can bring for your terror captains. I don't want you to be stuck using a terror typing. I don't want you to be stuck using a terror typing that forces you to be that terror typing because of what you decided not to get. Is basically what I'm getting at. And this is not trying to be mean or anything. This is just me just trying to put myself on the perspective of trying to get you guys in the mindset of prioritizing specific Pokemon, prioritizing typings, and not relying on Terra bailing you out every single time. You're gonna if you you basically don't want to fall too much in love with with a mechanic of terrestrialization, especially if you're using a lower tier system, you're forcing your lower tier mons or your terror captains to work unnecessary overtime to make up for what you lack to draft. That doesn't look good in the grand scheme of things, and at the most part, I'm trying to um, have you guys avoid making that mistake. Um, as usual, the order of Pokemon doesn't mean to draft it in that round. If you value a Pokemon earlier or later than specific Pokemon, by all means, you do you. Don't let the exact round that I put these Mons in be a premise of when to get them. If you like a Pokemon that a little bit higher than other people, by all means, go right ahead. Take it around early. If it makes you feel more comfortable, I won't stop you. Alternate options, as always, will be provided at the end of the draft. Just so you're not, if you want to make a copy of this team, that you're not stuck using specific mons. If you if you luck out and you don't get to draft what I have here, then you have alternate options to work with. Considering that we already have an offensive core and the balance core, I already talked about the balance and defensive core aspects earlier in the video. I won't go too much into that. Two strong priority options, luckily we already have one of them in Scizor, we will address having another one later on in the draft. At least two Stealth Rockers, none of the Pokemon we currently have um, currently get access to Stealth Rock, so we will be trying to address them as well. Spikes and Toxic Spikes, again, similar thing. Um, just nice to have the extra um, chip damage to go about doing extra damage for your opponent's team. One has a remover, at the very least. Uh, thankfully, this team does technically have Hazard Remover if in Defog Scizor. Um, granted, I don't really like Defog Scizor, especially considering it doesn't have access to Roost. I would like it a little bit better if it did, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Can't really do anything about that. But if you like Defog Scizor, again, I won't stop you. Um, of course, it also comes down to whether or not you're able to fit like Court Change with Cinderace and stuff like that. Or any form of, of rapid spinner that will also benefit your team for the most part. Two speed tiers above base 110. Technically speaking, we already have a 110 with Latios. Still want to get something faster than that, just in the case of you're going up against um, Latios for the most part. Or any other offensive Pokemon like a Iron Valiant, Roaring Moon, stuff like that. You want to have something at least along those lines with that speed tier. At least one wall breaker. Thankfully, this team already technically has two, three wall breakers. Specs Latios, Specs Enamorous, Ban Scizor. You have your options with this course. So in terms of wall breaking, you're not really going to be lacking that whatsoever. One ground immunity, we have two. So that's great. So barring like you're facing a mole breaker Escadrill, you will be fine for the long and for the most part. Electro immunity, obviously, to block Volt Switch to prevent a momentum for your opponent's team. You really want to stop that at any cost. One bulky water, um, water type is one of the best typing, both offensively and defensively. So having one is very, very nice for any team to have. A grounded poison type, just for the ability to absorb toxic spikes. You never really want to be caught. Um, in a situation where T spikes are a thing against you, and you really want to have the means of being able to absorb them at any time, whether it be through the grounded poison typing. If you make a Terra Captain um, part poison, that works too. But ideally, you want to have a grounded poison off the bat as opposed to relying on Terra to make up for that. 
one knockoff user at least. We have Scizor, which already accomplishes that, but more item, more ability to have item disruption on your team is never a bad thing to have. Uh, a fast taunt and encore user. Basically, it's just here to prevent your opponent from spamming setup options or it's having the means of getting up hazards or doing any of the shenanigans. This always has to have a means of preventing that from happening. And then, of course, Fire, Water, Grass, and Dragon Steel Fairy Core. We already accomplished the latter, and the former will be trying to work in with the rest of the draft. So, with that out of the way, let's jump right into the team. So, once again, like always, we'll be using the SPO uh, draft board to be drafting our team. We already have Latios, Enamorous, and Scizor already locked in. We are already under the assumption that these are going to be our first three picks with no snipes allowed. Granted, Scizor could potentially be around four Pokemon as well. But again, it more so the value determines on how much you value um, value Scizor as opposed to it being around three or around four Pokemon. I imagine Steel types would be taken pretty quickly and pretty fast within the first three rounds. So if you had to get the uh, if you had the ability to get a good Steel, the earlier you do it, the better. So. With that being said, let's jump right into the rest of the team. So we have our three round, our um, three months with um, Latios and Amherst and Scizor. We've already used 50 points, and we have 70 to use for the rest of the eight for eight more picks. Um, and of course, again, thank you to Shuffle King and PokeMMD for letting me use the draft board as a means to put this team together. So round four. I debated hard about this one, really, really badly. But round four, we have Keldeo, and for the most part, Keldeo, Keldeo could easily be Quackable. That's how well, that's how conflicted I was when it came to this draft. Do you want Keldeo or do you want Quackable? Quackable, if anything, feels more of a round three pick than Scizor. If you feel comfortable with Scizor falling to round four, and you want Quackable with this core. Get Quackable. I will not stop you. Both Pokemon work great. Main thing for Keldeo in this spot is it's a water type, it's a fighting type. It has the ability to get past Heatran, which Enamorous somewhat struggles with. It has Earth Power, but if you're dealing with like a Shuckaberry or an Air Balloon um, Heatran, then you want something a little bit more formidable that can come in, take the hit. And Keldeo, while it lacks recovery like Quackleville does, Keldeo also does provide the um, access to strong water and fighting type moves with um, Surf, Secret Sword, um, Flip Turn for Momentum, you have Flip Turn on Latios, you have U-Turn on Scizor, so you have a lot of momentum going here. You also have your Fast Taunt user. While it may not be seen as fast as 108 speed, it's still relatively fast enough to outspeed most of the stuff you want to outspeed to prevent them, your opponent from getting up rocks, setting up with like Calm Mind or whatever the case may be. So it's a good anti-stall mon um, to stop your opponent's defensive mons from being a nuisance. And for the most part, Keldeo also benefits from pressuring the Steel types from Enamorous, a pressure Steel types for Latios, pressure Steel types for Scizor. So yeah, this definitely works out for the best um, in terms of Keldeo on this particular draft, and it gives you another potential hard-hitting wall breaker because Specs Keldeo can be a thing, Scarf Keldeo can also be a thing, so a really good option there for sure for round four. All right, and then for round number five, I ended up going with Crooked out here. Um, so revive our team with a solid Stealth Rocker, um, additional knockoff support, a ground type, so we have the electric immunity. But again, the main thing is having a stealth rocker, a potential um, moxie sweeper with choice scarf. It's really, really good offensively, being a dark and ground type Pokemon, having stuff like close combat, uh, gunk shot for fairies. Um, obviously, if you're not able to get crooked out on this spot, another option would be to get like a Ting Lu. You could potentially have to go a little bit earlier. For Ting Lu, but both, but mainly having a f good offensive um, dark type Pokemon would benefit 
be beneficial for this team, especially granting the team a immediate ghost resist, which is always nice to have for any build. And like I said, Crooked Allergy is just really, really good being a stealth rocker that also acts as a dark type. So you have your psychic immunity, you have electric immunity, you have your additional knockoff support for item disruption, and just a good overall hard hitting physical attacker to go with the rest of the build. Then we have round number six, which is going to be Entei. Entei could easily be Arcanine, it doesn't really matter. But the main thing I went for with this slot was essentially just having something with initial solid priority. And Entei, while not really seen as a... It's not really seen much as in terms of a Pokemon that is drafted, but the nice thing about Entei, it is a hard-hitting fire type with access to strong priority. Again, Arcanine is, a, is available. You can get that. I think they're the same point value in this on this on this draft board. Um, there's also a Sui in Arcanine as well, which trades in a bit more speed for having access to Rockhead Head Smash and Flare Blitz while still having extreme speed on top of that. But I do believe that is a few more points to go after um, that you have to shell out. But regardless. The main thing with Entei is the ability to have more things on the team to pressure Steel types to make things easier for Latios and Enamorous and Scizor. Entei fits that build. Um, obviously, it can't deal with a Flash Fire Heat Trend, but it does get access to Bulldoze if it's not like a Sugarberry or Air Balloon. And the main thing with Entei is just having a hard hitting. Um, back of means of having some solid priority to go along with Scizor's uh, Bullet Punch and Quick Attack. So that is the Entei slot for that. Again, alternatives, Arcanine, Hasui and Arcanine. Um, and to a lesser extent, uh, Cerule Edge. Uh, Cerule Edge is also an option, but I believe that is also going to cost you a bit more points. But Cerule Edge also gives you a Fire Immunity. While still having, while still being a part ghost type, so you have your means of being a ghost type, so you have your rapid spin blocker. Then for round seven, we have Jolteon. Yes, I finally have Jolteon on a team. Um, less so for if you want, like, primary target for a Terra Captain. Yes, so you would want to get in a bit earlier. But the idea with Jolteon is having Pokemon faster than 110 speed. We have that with Jolteon. It's a solid Terra Captain. Um, good hard-hitting special attacker. Has Volts, Volt Switch for momentum. Lightning, um, Volt Absorb for electric immunity. And like I said, it's a it's a solid Terra option. But the main thing with Jolteon here is having the means of having something faster than base 110s. If you're not able to get Jolteon, another option would be like Kilowattrol, Hasui and Electrode, um, Thunderous, but it would, that would cost you a bit more points. But basically any fast, hard hitting Pokemon would definitely fit the bill in this slot and Jolteon definitely works out here for the aforementioned reasons. And then round eight, we need some hazards. So we got Bramblegast for uh, eight points here. I do like Bramblegast. Um, it's a Pokemon that I've wanted to draft for a while. But it does provide the team, the grass type, a ghost type, so we have a rapid spin blocker and a rapid sp and a spinner all in one. So, a uh, really good roll compression for Bramblegast here, like I said, um, spin blocker, a spinner, um, is really, really good offensively with access to power weapon poltergeist, can be ran defensively with access to strength sap. And for the most part, it does get access to a to um, Wind Rider, so it can act as a reliable flying immunity to certain hits, to certain moves like Hurricane, Heat Wave, stuff like that. But more importantly, also revives the team with spikes, which the team did not have. So yeah, all in all, very good value for a Pokemon like Bramble Gas for sure. Round number nine, though, we do have Muck though, because we need that grounded poison. We didn't have one, and Muck is really really good here for a good value at five points grounded poison 
Toxic Spike Setter, Nod Third, Knock Off User for our team. Does have some good priority with Shadow Sneak. Um, cover, recovery and Drain Punch can act as a curse user. Pain Split for recovery. It has a lot of good utility options at its disposal. Um, I did forget to mention, if you don't get Bramble Gas, um, there are some other options, although they're not really the best. Especially considering when it comes to being a low budget spiker with the ability to be a spin blocker. The list is few and far between. But if there is one option you can go for over Bramble Gas, there is Frost Lass. Um, while the typing is a little bit different, Frost Lass is also a, a very bit, it's much faster spiker and a spin blocker, but not a rapid spinner. So. If you want, if you can't get Bramble Gas and Frost Lass is available, you can get Frost Lass. Back to Muck though, I already pretty much talked about it. It's a Grounded Poison, really good utility, Knock Off, Drain Punch, Toxic Spikes, Pain Split for Recovery, Haze, to Disawaited Setup. So really, really good options at that. Um, other options to consider over Muck, there is Alolan Muck if you have the points to shell out for it. Um, there's also like a Suey and Quillfish, which is also a Grounded Poison. Um, other Grounded Poisons to consider, uh, stuff like Vileplume is also a thing. Granted, it does not get access to Toxic Spikes. If you're really strapped for points, there's also Swalot, which almost does the same thing. Like, they share the same sort of confines. It doesn't get access to Knock Off the or Drain Punch, but it's still a good low budget Grounded Poison for what you want to do for your team. So there's that. Then round number 10, we have Regirock. And the main reason for Regirock is we didn't have another Stealth Rocker on the team and considering what was available, um, it could have opted for like Knackle Stack on this slot too because it doesn't provide a team with an additional Ghost Resist. But the other nice thing about Regirock is it also provides the team with not only Stealth Rock, but also get access to like Iron Vest Body Press, just like Knackle Stack does. But the other thing it also provides is additional speed control, because it does get access to Thunder Wave. So yeah, it might not seem like much for a Pokemon like Retchy Rock, but being able to get, um, be another Stealth Rocker, be a solid Rock type Pokemon with an ability to be a Normal Resist, a Flying Resist, a Fire Resist, that's all pretty good things to consider when it comes to having a Pokemon like Retrorock. Like, the typing won't really come up that much, but considering what it provides for the team, especially considering that our only Rocker at this point was still Crocodile, it does provide a lot of um, utility for that matter. And having all these additional fighting weaknesses is already, because we have Latios, we have Enamorous, there's Bramble Gas as an immunity, and Muck as a resist as well. So. Piling up the fighting weaknesses isn't really going to hinder this team all that much. And then lastly, three points left. We have to get another Stealth Rocker for the team. And the best one to fit the build considering what the points we have left. We have Dunsparce. And the reasoning for Dunsparce is sort of similar to the reasoning for a Regirock. It's essentially a Stealth Rocker as well as a reliable way of speed control with access to glare or serene grace body slam whatever floats your boat but the other reasoning is it is a normal type pokemon so we have a ghost immunity on top of that so good utility for three points like i mentioned stealth rock um paralysis support and the recovery with roost and all that stuff so yeah, it doesn't seem like much for three points, but for the most part, considering what the team was lacking in terms of hazards as well as an ability to um, have a more immediate ghost resist or immunity at this point, it did fit the bill a little bit better considering what was left over. So... So, the last thing to address here for alternative options in terms of Regirock, um, if you want to be a bit more offensive in nature, I guess you could say, um, there is something to consider like Rampardos can also work if you want to be a bit more offensive. Like, Reg Rampardos is a lot more offensive in nature as opposed to Regirock. It does sacrifice a lot of 
bulk it's slightly faster but stuff like sheer force rock slides and um like fire not fire blocks like fire punches and all that stuff off a 167 attack pretty damn good um wouldn't really recommend it though there's also like like a rock midday or midnight whichever one floats your boat those are a bit more helpful for like hyper offensive sort of stuff and then Dunsparce can essentially be any real fat normal type Pokemon but overall it just seemed like the best one just for this particular um, just for the particular means of having a rocker as also a ghost immunity if you're able to save enough points to get like the Dunsparce you can do that as well but Dunsparce works just fine as opposed on this particular team in general now for what I promised um, I will be right back to give you a more offensive version of this team so stay tuned all right so here we are guys with the second draft utilizing the core of Latios Enamorous and Scizor but this time we're taking it into more of an offensive approach so what do I mean by offensive approach is there will still be aspects similar to the balanced approach team with a little bit more emphasis on on offense and by that I mean there will be less defensive switch-ins there will still be defensive mons on this particular team but it will be few and far in between it will probably be at most two maybe three Pokemon the main idea with a offensive build is you're focusing less on trying to adjust for your opponent's threats and trying to make it harder for your opponent to react to what you could potentially bring with these three pokemon you have the ability to keep your opponent on the back foot through the combination of sheer raw power and good timing with your momentum Latios gets flip turn scissor gets u-turn you have the ability to keep on offensive pressure on your opponent at all times and this team and in the end game basically strives to make it difficult for your opponent to react to whatever combination you bring and just keep on the pressure never take your foot off the gas whether it be setup whether it just be hard hitting straight balls to the wall offense the other nice thing about this core as a whole Latios gets access to memento so you have ability to set up with stuff like calm mind um, agility enamorous but you have to not be contrary you can do SD scissor so you have options in terms of setup so we're looking to address and constantly keep the pressure up with that offense so round four this time though on a build like this would be infernape and the main reason for infernape is it gives the team an offensive stealth rocker and on top of that good speed in base 108 taunt but more importantly you have priority whether it be Iron Fist Mock Punch or Nasty Plot Vacuum Wave, you have your options to pick and choose with Infernape and in conjunction with being able to have Infernape weaken those Steel types, deal with Heat Tran for Latios and Enamorous, it's very, very nice to have as an offensive mod for the most part. <clears throat> Round number five, though, we will have our real first pivot. Um, less so pivot, more so having a defensive Pokemon on the team, and that is going to be our primary way of getting a hazards on this team or an offensive build, Clodsire. So, why Clodsire? Well, basically, Clodsire fulfills a lot of roles compressed into one. Stealth Rock, Spikes, Toxic Spikes, Grounded Poison, and Electric Immunity all in one. It may seem odd to put Clodsire on an offensive team but I did mention earlier that this team was going to have at the very least two pivots while you want to be offensive you don't have the liberty of being able to switch into everything so at the very least Claude Sire can act as that means of being your pivot for you if it means sacking Claude Sire off to get in an offensive Pokemon for free then if you have to go that route then so be it but if it, at the same time though Claude Sire provides this team with needed roll compression, allowing you to still have a defensive mon while giving ways to having more ways options for your team to be offensive in nature. That is also true for our round six pick, Milotic. 
Milotic is another defensive Pokemon that can still function offensively, especially if your opponent has means of getting rid of hazards via Defog. With Milotic in general, you have access to Competitive, which allows you to then punish your opponent for defogging away your hazards by hitting them with plus two surfs. It also gets access to momentum with flip turn. So again, you have your pivot, you have something with recovery, you have pivoting options to get slow momentum back into your offensive threats, which is the main thing I was going for. Your main thing you're going for here is having a pivot between Claude Sire and Milotic having means to come in, tank hits, and either recover off the damage, do damage itself, or being able to get your momentum in Milotic's case. The other nice thing about Claude Sire, you can easily run a check pack on Claude Sire to make it more of a pivot, giving you a one-time means of being a way to take a hit switch back into a more offensive threat and constantly keep the pressure on your opponent. That's pretty much the nice thing about it, especially with having a defensive core like this with access to reliable recovery. So that's pretty much the means I was going for here with this defensive core. To keep up the pressure, we have more speed. And by that, Hisuian Electrode. Base 150 speed, you're outspeeding most of the metagame as a whole. <coughs> Alternatively, as opposed to a Hisuian Electrode, you could potentially get Reggie Alecki if you so choose to. You do have a means of getting rid of ground types on this team as it is. So getting Reggie Alecki if you want to have that sheer fire, a surefire rapid spinner and still have momentum with Volt Switch and all that stuff, Reggie Alecki isn't that bad of an option. But for now, Hisuian Electro is here because of the fact that it fits the point, it's a little bit cheaper, and it can still give you a fast, hard-hitting Pokemon, especially with in conjunction with Terrasalization. It gives you Taunt, Momentum, Hard-Hitting, Prowess between Electric and Grass Stab. You can't really go wrong with a Pokemon like that. Then for the 8th round, we have Miss Magius, which is basically here as a means of being another ground immunity, as well as being a spin blocker thanks to it being a ghost type. Another means to this to Miss Magius, another Pokemon with access to, to Memento, to allow Calmine Latios, or Calmine Enamorous, or SD Scizor, or SD Inferni, Nasty Plot Inferni. You get the idea. Miss Magius can also be Nasty Plot itself, so it's not essentially stuck, seen as a slept on Pokemon. It's really good value for 8 points, especially considering it provides you with an offensive spin blocker and another ground immunity. You pretty much get the gist where I'm going with this. It's just keeping up offensive pressure on your opponent. Then, round number 9, we have even more pressure in Zoroark. Zoroark is actually really cool on a team like this because of the mind games you can play with your opponent. With the exception of some things like Claude Sire and Milotic and whatnot, but guess what? You have a third Memento user, so even more means of setting up for the rest of your team to function. On top of that, of playing mind games with your opponent, Zoroark can Sword Dance, it can Nasty Plot, it can Knock Off, it's an offensive Dark type, it gives you Sucker Punch for priority, and a reliable Scarfer as opposed to having them like Miss Mages, and it also gives you more momentum with u turn. So yeah, you get the idea, you're constantly keeping the pressure up. The idea and the name of the game is you have one of your three Memento users to then ease the pressure and make it easier for you to have something else come in, set up, and win, and you have the breakers to go along with your setup to make things easier for you and harder for your opponent. So that's why I like Zoroark particularly, especially considering we had a, we need a dark type and three memento users is never bad, especially on a more offensive build. So, two Pokemon left. And with one of the last two Pokemon, we do have Lycanroc Midday for 7 points. This gives us another means of being a Suicide Hazard lead to get up Stealth Rock. It's Endeavor, it gets it down to 1 HP, Revenge Killer with Accelerock, so on and so forth. It still functions very well as a solid Revenge Killer with Accelerock. We have a third means of priority to go with Infernape and Scizor. So you're not just stuck being 
a one-trick pony with Lycan Rock. You can use it a lot more offensively and keep pressure on your opponent's set of mods that are weak to Accelera. So you're always nice to have that sort of thing in the back. And 112 speed is never a bad thing to have on a team like this. So, now we get to the fun part about this draft. You thought I couldn't get any fun already with already having three Memento users. But why stop with Memento? We have one point left. You gotta make the most of everything you have at your disposal. And nothing comes more valuable than having your, to force your opponent to prep for something that could potentially come on a regular basis. Not really regular basis, but you have to put that thought into their heads. So with the last pick, one point left, I had to make it count. I had to. And the best way to go about this, it's the one, the only, the near and dear to everyone's heart, the bug. You have to put the bug on. The one thing you never want to think about in the back of your opponent's mind is, why the hell am I looking at a charger bug on my screen? If you can make your opponent look at your matchup and be like, I gotta deal with all these offensive threats and the potential of sticky web and a slow pivot with Volt Switch, charger bug is absolutely fantastic for this role. Like I mentioned, sticky web. You never expect sticky web in a heavy duty boots meta. Never, but considering that you have Scizor with access to knockoff, Infernape with access to knockoff, Zoroark with access to knockoff, you have three means of disawaiting knockoff. You have Lycanroc to revenge kill most flying type Pokemon that do not care for Sticky Web. You can handle other levitating mods with the rest of your offense. Charger Bug is not a bad option here for one point. And anyone who's used Charger Bug, like myself, knows you have to put that premise. I have lost to Charger Bug before because they got my opponent got a webs and I had no way to get rid of it. That was freaking amazing. And the other thing I love about Charger Bug is it's actually tankier than you think, especially in conjunction with a Violet. It can tank hits. It doesn't have to be a sash lean, whatever. But overall. I absolutely love Charger Bug on a team like this. Having the ability <clears throat> to get up webs if you need them. Have Miss Magius, which can spin block. You have Hasui Electro with fast taunt so your opponent can't defog. And then on top of that, you have your opponents that have to deal with three knockoff users, potentially four setup sp sweepers. Well, actually, more than four. One, two, three, four, five, six potentially seven setup Pokemon with three Memento users. Ridiculously, ridiculously insane to think about that sort of concept on an offensive team like this. So that is pretty much the premise I was going with here. If you want to build offense, this is my interpretation of just utilizing Memento between Latios, between Miss Magius, between Zoroark using Memento and then letting something else come in, set up, and go to work. And then you still have your defensive backbone of Claude Sire and my Lotic to fall back on when things get a little bit dicey. So that's pretty much what I like about this offensive build. But with that being said, guys, um, that is going to be it for episode 4 on how to draft in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, it was a lot of fun putting it together, and I do apologize that it took so long to get this video out. But regardless, I had a lot of fun putting this thing together. Let me guys know in the comments what you would do with this core of Latios, Enamorous, and Scizor. Um, let me also know what other type of cores you would like me to build with. Any other things you would like me to talk about prior to going into these drafts. I honestly have a lot of fun putting this stuff together. I hope it was worth the wait, guys. I do apologize again. These will be back up and running on time next Thursday for episode 5. I hope you guys are looking forward to it as much as I am. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you again to Chuckle King and PokeMMD and the rest of the SPL for letting me use their draft. And I'll leave it at that, guys. Thank you guys again for watching. And until the next time, this is Tone, signing off for now. Peace out.